In the last lecture, we considered intrinsic defects. These are defects that occur in crystals that maintain the ideal stoichiometry. In this lecture, we're going to look at extrinsic defects. An extrinsic defect is one where we introduce an atom or atoms that are not normally present in a perfect crystal. So there's two kinds of extrinsic defects in ionic or polar covalent compounds. We can talk about isovalent substitution, whereby the substituting ion has the same charge as the ion it is replacing. So in the gemstones ruby and emerald, we are replacing an aluminum ion, which has a 3 plus charge, with a chromium ion that also has a 3 plus charge. In a YAG laser, we are replacing the yttrium ions with neodymium ions, and both of those have a 3 plus charge. So these are some important examples of isovalent substitution. The other type of substitution we encounter is called alleovalent substitution. And this kind of defect is one where the ion that substitutes has a different charge than the ion it replaces. And because we must maintain charge balance, alleovalent substitution is going to also trigger a change somewhere else in the crystal. So let's take a look at the impact of allovalent doping in ionic compounds where the oxidation states of all the ions are fixed. On this slide, we see two examples of doping where we introduce an excess of positive charge. So in the first example, if we replace a calcium 2 plus ion with a yttrium 3 plus ion, we would have too much positive charge. And to balance that in the fluoride structure, what happens is that we get anion interstitials. And so we get extra anions that would not be there in a perfect crystal. The other way that you can compensate for this excess positive charge would be to put vacancies on the cation site. So if you were to substitute calcium 2 plus for sodium in the sodium chloride crystal, the compensating defect mechanism is going to be a vacancy on the cation site. The other side of the spectrum would be allovalent doping, where we substitute a cation that reduces the positive charge. The first example we talked about just a couple lectures ago, if we take an SiO2 network and we substitute aluminum 3 plus for the silicon 4 plus, we don't have enough positive charge. And to compensate for that, we could have cation interstitials. For example, we could have lithium cations going into the structure. So for every silicon that gets replaced by an aluminum, we end up with a lithium interstitial. And we saw when we were talking about zeolites that when we have a sufficient number of these cation interstitials and the cations get large enough, this leads to a change in the topology of the network. So instead of getting a dense SiO2 structure, we get these zeolites that have pores in them. That's not always the case. Oftentimes there might be enough room to accommodate the interstitials without disturbing the crystal structure. The other way we can compensate for having not enough positive charge would be to introduce vacancies on the anion site. When we substitute yttrium 3 plus for the zirconium 4 plus ion, now suddenly we don't have enough positive charge. And here, the compensating defect is a vacancy on the oxygen site. And this substitution, in fact, is very important from a technology point of view. Compositions of this type are typically called yttrium stabilized zirconia. And they are among the very best oxygen ion conductors at high temperature and they find many applications for that use. Another situation where we have this allovalent substitution is in semiconductors. And in fact, this kind of substitution is of tremendous importance in the semiconductor industry. So if we start with an elemental semiconductor, say something like silicon, and now we are going to make substitutional replacement of some silicon atoms with an element that has either more or fewer valence electrons, 
that will effectively dope the structure. If we substitute an atom that has more valence electrons, such as phosphorus, the extra valence electron is actually somewhat free to move around the lattice. And so that boosts the electrical conductivity by many orders of magnitude. We can think of this as being the equivalent of reduction because we have effectively added an electron to the silicon host lattice. The opposite kind of doping is when we substitute an atom that has fewer valence electrons than silicon, for example, boron or aluminum. And in that case, now we have a missing electron at the substitutional site, and that can effectively take an electron away from the rest of the lattice. And so we would call that missing electron a hole. This acceptor doping is alternatively called hole doping, and the donor doping is alternatively called electron doping. Notice that the acceptor doping would be the equivalent of oxidizing the host lattice because it's going to lose one electron to the substituted ion. Now, something quite interesting happens when we do aliovalent doping in transition metal compounds. So as you know, transition metals typically have variable oxidation states. And in these materials, oftentimes, the way that the structure compensates for the aliovalent doping would be to change the oxidation state of the transition metal ion. So if we take the compound lithium cobalt O2, right, this is probably the most important cathode material in lithium ion batteries and we remove some of the lithium, right? So we're creating cation vacancies. Suddenly we don't have enough positive charge to attain charge balance. Then we're going to oxidize some of the cobalt from three plus to four plus. Or another way we might put it is the average oxidation state of cobalt goes from plus three to a little bit above plus three. We get the same kind of effect when we add anion interstitials, because once again, we don't have enough positive charge to maintain neutrality. If you take lanthanum-2, copper O4, right, this is the original host structure for the cuprate high TC superconductors, and you add oxygen interstitials, the effect of that is the copper oxidation state must increase from plus two to something higher. So it depends on the level of anion interstitials, but we might push the oxidation state up to 2.2 or 2.3. And when we change the copper oxidation state in that way, we can turn on superconductivity in this compound. Now, another way of achieving the same thing would be to do aliovalent doping where we substitute a lower charged cation for the lanthanum. So for example, if we put in strontium for lanthanum, because the strontium is only 2 plus, that means it has basically the same effect. It increases the copper oxidation state. And in fact, this was the way that Bednors and Mueller first discovered superconductivity in the cuprates. We can also use doping to affect reduction of the cation oxidation state. So here we're going to go back to battery materials. TIS2 was an electrode in the very early lithium ion batteries. And as the battery discharges, you intercalate lithium in between the titanium sulfide layers. And when you do that, to compensate for this positive charge that's coming into the crystal, the titanium gets reduced from four plus to something below that. We can also affect reduction by removing anions. So Tungsten trioxide is a pale yellow semiconductor, but if you introduce oxygen ion vacancies, you reduce the tungsten from plus six to something lower, typically something intermediate between plus five and plus six, and that leads to a family of compounds that are called bronzes. And, and then you get conductivity, you get colors like blue and black, and they're actually quite interesting compounds. And just as we saw on the other slide, we could also just do a substitutional type doping where we replace calcium in CAMNO3 with an ion that has a higher charge like lanthanum. 
And so in CaMnO3, the manganese is 4 plus. But if we introduce enough lanthanum, we can lower that down to maybe 3.5 or 3.3. And actually, when we do that, that triggers something called colossal magnetoresistance. Compounds in that solid solution actually can show very large uh, million times change in the resistivity upon application of a magnetic field. A notation that we'll use for describing extrinsic doping is called the Kroger-Vink notation. And this is a statement of what Kroger-Vink notation is. We've got a large letter, let's call that the base, and that's going to be the elemental symbol for whatever the substituting atom is. If we're talking about a vacancy, it would be a small v. Then we have this b. The b subscript here is the site that's being substituted for. So if we're putting calcium onto a lanthanum site, then B would be lanthanum. That's the site that's being replaced. If you're putting a defect in as an interstitial, this is a lowercase i, and sometimes we'll encounter a defect going to the surface, which would be a lowercase s. And then the superscript here, that's how we denote the charge of the defect with respect to the charge of that site in the host lattice. We're going to use dots for positive charges and primes for negative charges. So let's look at some examples. We'll just go back to the examples we just talked about. Here we have lithium vacancies, and so the Kroger-Vink notation for a lithium vacancy is as follows. The thing we're introducing to the lattice is a vacancy, so we use the lowercase v. The thing that was at the vacancy site before the defect was introduced is a lithium. So the subscript is a lithium. And because that lattice site used to have a positive one charge and now it has no charge at all, it is, with respect to the host lattice, negatively charged by one charge unit. And so we put a one prime there. If we were to have anion interstitials, like in lanthanum copper oxide, then the Kroger-Vink notation would be as follows. The foreign thing that's in the lattice is an oxygen ion. It is sitting at the interstitial site, so that means the subscript is this lowercase i. And because an oxide ion has a negative 2 charge, and it's sitting on a site that would normally be uncharged, the vacancy has a negative 2 charge. And then if we look at the last one, the lanthanum copper oxide, where we replace some of the lanthanum with the strontium, the Kroger-Vink notation for that defect would be strontium on a lanthanum site, and the charge of that defect is minus 1. Now, that's something just to keep aware of. You might be thinking to yourself, hmm, strontium has a charge of plus 2. So why does this defect have a charge of minus 1? It's not important what the charge of the ion going into the lattice is. What we're referencing here is the charge of this site versus the charge of this site without a defect. So normally that site would have a plus 3 charge. Now it has a plus 2 charge, and so that makes its charge minus 1. Notice that all of these defects are negatively charged, and the negatively charged defects are going to have the effect of oxidizing the cation because we are introducing negative charge into the lattice, so therefore the transition metal ions have to go to a higher positive oxidation state to counterbalance that. Here are the other three defects we looked at a couple slides back. Why don't you pause the video and write out the Kroger-Vink notation for each of these defects, and then come back and we'll go over them. Okay, well, let's start with the first one. What is the defect? The defect is a lithium cation. Where is that lithium cation going? It's going to an interstitial site. And because the lithium cation has a plus one charge, and the interstitial site normally has no charge, this is going to be a defect with a plus one charge. So lithium 
subscript i, and then a dot as the superscript. If we introduce anion vacancies onto the tungsten trioxide lattice, that's going to be a vacancy. That's the thing that's introduced. Oxygen is the site where that extrinsic defect is going. And then the charge of this one is positive 2, because the oxygen site normally carries a negative 2 charge, and now there's nothing there. So with respect to the host lattice, this is a plus 2 defect. And then in the last case, it's lanthanum going on to a calcium site. And because lanthanum has a higher positive charge by 1, plus 3 versus plus 2, means this is a defect with a plus 1 charge. This is just a little preview of something that we'll get to later when we get to chapter 10. But if we come back to the semiconductor doping issue, so let's talk about donor or electron doping of a semiconductor. Here, we're replacing silicon with a phosphorus atom. Now, because phosphorus has one more valence electron, if it were to lose that valence electron and give it up to the rest of the lattice, let's think about the charge of that site. Now, if that electron goes away, I mean, the bonding and the number of valence electrons for the phosphorus is the same as it is for any silicon atom. But Remember that a phosphorus nucleus has one more positive charge than a silicon nucleus. So that defect would be positively charged. It would be a plus one charge defect. And what happens is at low temperature, the electron that it donates to the lattice actually feels an attraction to the positively charged defect center, and it orbits it in something like a hydrogenic-like orbital. And so we'll talk about this all more when we get to semiconductors, but I just throw it out here to show you that the charge of these defects can have really important implications